Welcome to Wesley Impact. I'm Keith Garner. How important do you think it is to connect with like-minded and like-spirited people? Thank you for being part of the programme today. I asked the question at the top of the show about being like-minded and like-spirited with others because being connected to a community can be life-changing. Earlier this week, Wesley Mission held our annual Life Force Memorial Service at the Sydney Opera House, where we opened our arms and joined with people on their journey of losing a loved one to suicide. We've held that service for many years. In fact, it's my 13th service of this kind. To some, it's an important annual event, which is part of their journey. And to others attending for a year or two, it helps them to answer some of the questions or at least bring a measure of healing. The people who gather with a common experience can connect and there's a sense of understanding amongst those who attend. So much is understood without a word being spoken. For that reason, I'd like to encourage you to consider being part of a community with like-minded people in whatever area that's relevant to you in life. You'll see a clip from the Sydney Life Force Memorial Service a little later in the show. And I'll also speak to the Reverend Simon Hansford. Simon is the moderator of the NSW and ACT Synod of the Uniting Church in Australia and has responsibility for the church's work. We'll also be joined by Matt Doland and Naomi Miller with the Wesley Impact Band as he sings He Loves Us. And I'll be continuing an exploration in the book of James. Today we're brought face to face with the challenge of how the tongue needs to be tamed. It's a very practical passage in James 3. Now let's take a look at a short film from the Life Force Memorial Service previously held in Sydney. Welcome to the Wesley Life Force Suicide Memorial Day. We come here today from different parts of Australia to remember loved ones lost to suicide. We meet as a community, united in our loss, and as a community, we are entitled to ask for help and support. I cannot change my past, but the future I can. It is just up to me, as it is to all of you today, to stop the silence that surrounds the topic of suicide that often prevents people from seeking help. The only way we can dispel the stigma of suicide is by talking about it. Suicide is everyone's business. The process for mending a broken heart is both painful and I have to say, very slow. The journey of healing starts with small steps, leading from darkness to hope, from death to a renewed commitment to life. Wesley Life Force Memorial Wall is an important part of our services. We have the wall here at our services, which we hold in Sydney, Brisbane, Adelaide, Newcastle, and this year in Darwin. The walls are a position where people can leave a message of love and hope. For me, it's no longer a battle, but it's something I will never stop doing because we have to create awareness, we have to lessen stigma, we have to open the topic of, of suicide, we should be able to talk about it freely. Behind me is a wall here and I always come a little early to see people putting up these pictures and words that are reminders of people's pain and loss, but they're tangible ways in which people can express that loss. If you're not able to make any of the Wesley Life Force Memorial services that we host around the country in different capital cities, the memorial wall is available online for you to leave messages of love and hope. We invite you to leave a message at wesleymission.org.au. Your truth is a compass that points me back north. 
If you would like to learn more about Wesley Mission, visit wesleymission.org.au. You can find help in our community services, connect with our church and congregations, discover a volunteer role that suits you, stay up to date on the latest news and information, donate to support our work and help make a positive difference in your community. You can also connect with us on social media and subscribe to receive the latest news and information about Wesley Mission directly into your inbox. Visit wesleymission.org.au. I don't feel safe in this house. It's not our home. The people here are scary. I'm worried something bad will happen. That's why I'm hiding here with my mum and my little sister. They're scared too. We don't want to stay, but mum says there's nowhere else to go. If we leave, we have to sleep outside. I just want to run away. In New South Wales, 18% of people experiencing homelessness are children. Your donation of $49 can help give children like Liam and Mia a safe place to sleep and keep them off the streets. Because children should not run away, children should run and play. Please donate now at wesleymission.org.au. Now, please don't hesitate to be in touch. If you'd like to find out more about our work at Wesley Mission, or if we can be actually of a help to you, our website and email address are on the screen now. Now, my guest today is NSW and ACT Synod Moderator of the United Church in Australia, the Reverend Simon Hansford. Welcome, Simon. Thanks, Keith. Good to be here. Yeah, that's a real handful, all that title, you know. <laughs> now, but you've been a minister, give us an idea, you've been a minister for some years now, ordained in the early 90s, is that, is that right? Yeah, ordained in 1990, yeah, and uh, yeah. spent some time in Dubbo and in Queanbeyan and in the New England Northwest and now in town. Dubbo was for quite a considerable time. 12 years in Dubbo, yeah, fantastic yeah. time. Yeah, yeah, did you really? You really feel that was a definitive time for you? Yeah, and very, very important in shaping my thinking about myself and about ministry and being in a community that was so different to my growing up in Sydney. Yeah. But your, your most recent local parish, of course, is Tamworth. Yeah, so Tamworth and Dubbo are similar and dissimilar. Well, we know yeah. Tamworth is, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, the, play. <laughs> the country so, music. Indeed. Yeah, and did you did you get engaged with that kind of thing? Yeah, well, our, our church actually hosts um, a, a band or bands all week during the festival, and where there are gospel services and gospel breakfasts, and there's a range of things that go on, and the town is uh, transformed for that that ten days to. You know, yeah, yeah. Tell us uh, how you're finding the moderator's role. It's been really good. I, I, was, I was really worried it'd be all about baby kissing and ribbon, ribbon cutting, and that hasn't been the case at all. Been a whole lot of really um, good ways of engaging about conversations about faith and about the church. But I think perhaps most importantly about how we engage in the world around us. And I've been able to have conversations that help us think those things through more effectively. And I'm really pleased about that. And tell us about the, the kind of church. The United Church is a very varied church in terms of the kind of churches and size of churches and, and locations. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, in the rural church through to the city, you'll find congregations that are very, very large and very, very small. And I think um, in many ways we haven't fully moved on from our heritage of the three churches that came together. So there's often towns and suburbs where there are churches very nearby and those sort of, those can cause either fra fraction or struggles or they can be a great sign of strength because they can have different flavours and different purposes. Yeah. And, and, and really, if you're going to be true to New South Wales, it's important to be in the rural areas, isn't it? Yes, important. Well, I think the rural church is, is critical because the thing is, I think often we mistake the church as being about an isolated group, but in fact, especially in the rural community, we're engaged in a whole range of ways in the world around us, and that's a great sign for the church. And obviously, I mean, I do know the people in the mega churches, but I yep. do think we have a, a unique role in some of these small communities to maintain the flag of faith that the... the Absolutely, and I, and I think too, it, and I, in the best sense of the word, a pragmatic sense of faith too, that faith gets involved, faith in Jesus Christ calls us into the community. Faith says you'll help with the fencing after the fire. Faith says you'll help with um, bringing food during the drought. Faith is not just isolate, but very much calling us into the world around us. I mean, I've spoken to moderators at different times and they yeah. often talk about uh, things that arise and the church being in there first. We're, we're if you like, yep. part of the, the emergency services of the world. Absolutely. Well, I was driving here this morning and they were talking about the big Atatra fires and our chaplaincy program of disaster recovery were there first, engaging in the community and providing great support. Yeah, absolutely. How does your faith impact with the role that you do now? 
Well, I think for me, it, 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 the question that I was concerned about was that I didn't want to become an office person or a city-based person, and that hasn't happened at all. So my faith really... I think my faith keeps me impatient and irritated about being too confined to one particular space. And that's a reminder that Jesus calls us into the world. And also, too, I'm, I'm not that tolerant of just being in church conversations. I want to be involved in how do we engage in the world? How do we serve the world? How do we, like your suicide video just then, how do we talk to people at the critical times of their lives rather than just be decorative or be calling from the sidelines? Mm. That's what my faith calls me. And, and as moderator, I want to encourage our church to be both telling the story about how our faith works, but also engaging helpfully and hopefully in the world around us. Yeah. And is hope really part of what you want to say? Yeah, and I think we, we use the word hope, as you know, like we hope it rains or I hope this thing comes yeah, to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. That isn't the hope at all I'm talking about. I'm talking about a hope that says we believe in a God where life comes from death. We believe in a God who raises Jesus from the death. We believe in a God who rests hope from darkness. And that's the hope we're calling upon to believe in, that, that despite struggles, despite the drought right now at our, at our rural communities, we are loved, we are valued there is possibility of community and support and strength from all around us. And there's a God who is with us. And do you feel sustained yourself by the church? Yeah, I do. It's, it's, uh, it's interesting, being in the rural church, often you're a bit more separated from the, the synod stuff. Yeah. But I do feel supported and I, and I feel, people talk about you know, being prayed for. I have folk who tell me all the time that they're praying for me every day. And I find that humbling and extraordinary uh, there's a little old lady in Tamworth who says to me, you know, she says, I pray for you every day. Mm. And it, it feels like she does. Mm -hmm. And that to me is a mm -hmm. great gift. And certainly being part of the church in a way that I hadn't experienced before. What's the biggest challenge the church faces? I'm not now talking about um, just sexuality or, or life and death issues. I'm talking about the church as a whole. What's the biggest issue that it, it really has to tackle? Well, I, I think when I first started in ministry 28, 30 years ago, I think the church had an accepted and um, normalised part of the community, and that isn't true now. Mm -hmm. I think the credibility we may have had 30 years ago that was automatically given to us mm -hmm. has mm -hmm. changed, and often through our own fault. Mm -hmm. So the question, I think, for the church is how we prove our credibility, prove the quality of our witness and our ministry, and not just by saying, look at the old days, what are those things, like Wesley Mission does, what are those things that we're doing right now that make a real hopeful difference to people's lives? And that's where the challenge will be, because I think uh, the church around the world is saying, we're preaching the truth, but if folk aren't listening, we have to be able to engage with people in the community. Simon, thanks for sharing with us from the heart oh. a bit about yourself. And, and although we can't all promise everybody that's sharing this to pray for you every day, there will be people that know you a bit better now and will be able to put a face to the name when they hear it. Thanks, Keith. Let's please welcome back to Wesley Impact now, Matt Dolan and Naomi Miller to sing He Loves Us. for me His love's like a hurricane I am a tree bending beneath the weight of His wind and mercy When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me and oh how he loves us so oh how he loves us how he loves us so. Out of 
off my chest I don't have time to maintain these regrets When I think about the way He loves us Oh, how He loves us Oh, how He loves us Oh, how He loves us He loves us Oh, how He loves us Oh, how He loves us Oh, how He loves us He loves us Oh, how He loves us Oh, how He loves us Oh, how He loves us He loves us Oh, how He loves us Oh, how Experience the Galilee and the towns and cities where Jesus was raised and called his home. Capernaum, Nazareth, Tabga, Magdala, Caesarea Philippi, Bethsaida, Tiberias, and of course, the Sea of Galilee all feature in this six-part series as Keith Garner explains the first century context of biblical events. Jesus was born during a time of change in the political and economic leadership of this region. Fishermen around the lakeside was really one of the big businesses. Why Jesus? Why didn't people ignore him? Why did they take him seriously? And what are the questions we should be asking today if we're going to take Jesus seriously? The Man of Galilee is available now and comes with a study guide for leaders, small groups and individuals. For more, visit wesleymission.org.au. So let me read, if I can, from James chapter 3, reading from verse 1 through to verse 12. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal or take ships as an example. Although they're so large and are driven by strong winds, they're steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire. A world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be so. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Well, there's a passage for you. Continuing in James, we find that chapter 3 revolves around the subject of real and true wisdom. The writer suggests that not many should seek to be teachers because they are to be judged more strictly than others. The section opens up with a self-confession on the writer's part and deals with the taming of the tongue. The person who makes no mistakes is like a well-trained horse. The unleashed tongue corrupts 
the whole of a person. The tongue actually affects the whole of the way a person is seen by what is said. It refers to teachers more than it does to others because they use their, their, their language, their, their interaction with people very, very strongly. The tongue can be a source of great good, but also the opposite. This is one of the main fact features of the passage. That which is one thing can also be another. In verse 2, we're told we all make mistakes, and this demonstrates our common humanity. All of us know, we know that this is in the teaching of Paul. The very famous text is, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We know that we all get it wrong. We all make mistakes. And this demonstrates what it means to be a human being. Then in verse 4, the tongue guides our lives like the rudder of a ship. We need guidance. And for our own lives, the way we set our lives, the things we do, the engagement we have in our society, in our community, is often determined by what we say and how we speak. Those things are so very, very important. In verse 5, in the same passage, we're told it's small, and yet it has the power to initiate and change events. I have on my bookshelves a, a book that talks about speeches that change the world. Speeches? Surely not words that can change the world. But when you think of Martin Luther King uh, Jr., when he stood up and made that, that speech at the Washington Memorial, there you, you know very well, this is going to be an earth-shattering speech. And, and that's true time and time again. People speak words, and those words have the power to change people's thinking, to change actual events. Then in verses 7 to 8, the call is to tame the tongue in our lives. Oh gosh, this is probably in the personal sense, the most difficult thing for all of us, to have the tongue of our lives tamed, to have it so that we know truly what is happening, not to let it loose, just to go its own way and to do whatever it wants to do, but to say the right thing in the right place. Not only is the tongue wonderful in the sense that it can speak very clearly at special times, just as Simon shared with us, um, a person saying to him, I pray for you every day, that's a word of encouragement in life. Uh, the words that he and other people say in communities as they move around, as they engage with people, can make such a difference. We need to be a people who know what it is to say the right thing, to say the right thing in the right place at the right time. Oh, what a wonderful truth it is that the tongue can have that kind of influence in the world in which we, we live. And it can have that life-changing impact in terms of community, in terms of society, in terms of where things are. And as one who feels called as a preacher, we know that the, at the heart of Christian ministry is the, the word that can be spoken. In fact, when we talk about the Bible, we talk about the word of God. When we talk about God's creative word, it's using language that is very familiar to this theme in the third chapter of James. Thomas Watson concluded a, a, a passage in this way. God has given us two ears, but one tongue to show that we should be swift to hear, but slow to speak. God has set a double fence before the tongue, the teeth and the lips, to teach us to be wary that we offend not with our tongue. It's a wonderful truth, isn't it? Oh, two of one, just one of the tongue. So we need to be careful. We need to be ready to speak a word, to speak a powerful word of love and grace into communities that need to hear it, into a world that's ready to hear the reconciling word of Jesus Christ and his hope and his peace and his grace as we reach out to other people. If you would like to contact Keith and find out more about today's program, write to us at Wesley Mission, Post Office Box A5555, Sydney South 1235, or you can send us an email to impacttv at wesleymission.org.au. On our website, you can catch up on past episodes of Wesley Impact, find out more about our work, read online magazines and articles, and connect with us on social media. You can also connect through Keith's blog, and stay up to date on all the latest news and information from Wesley Mission, wesleymission.org.au. Losing a loved one to suicide is a sorrow unlike any other, but you are not alone. 
Wesley Mission holds annual Wesley Life Force Memorial Services in Brisbane, Adelaide, Sydney and Newcastle each year for those affected by suicide to come together in a spirit of comfort and hope. For more information, please visit wesleymission.org.au or call 1800 100 024. Thank you for being with us today. I hope you found James on the tongue interesting. And my guest, Simon, I hope that was stimulating too to learn more about the work of the Uniting Church across New South Wales. I'd like to come back to the question I raised at the top of the show. How important is it to connect with like-minded and like-spirited people? When we're part of a community, there's a sense of acceptance and belonging. So often we come into contact with people who feel like they don't belong in a busy city or in the suburbs, country town that we come from. And so belonging is important. Of course, a local church is a good place to start. And you can also follow your own interests there. I know of a church in Sydney that recently started a community garden with a small group of five who meet there every week. They're finding commonality. It's been great to meet with you on the show today. I hope we'll see you at the same time next week. Until then, God bless you. Wesley Mission walks alongside people of all ages struggling with homelessness, addictions, mental health issues and financial stress. To find out more, visit wesleymission.org.au.